Please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. President Daly? Here. Vice President Headland? Here. Trustee Clements? Here. Trustee McNall? Here. And Trustee Parr? Here. Thanks for being here, everybody. Um, our next Board of Education meeting will be on Tuesday, April 20th at 7 p.m. right here in the auditorium. And the workshop topic will be the elementary school detail report. Uh, for those who have not been following along, we've been having uh, different detail reports throughout the year, um, and it's the elementary school turn. Um, the Board of Education trustee candidate petitions are available. We have two seats up for election. Uh, those who are interested should contact Catherine Platt, our district clerk, um, through her email, cplatt at haldaneschool.org, or stop into the district office. You need to pick up a petition packet um, and those petition packets are due on Monday, April 19th at 5 p.m. So there is still time for anyone who is interested. Um, and all of us here on the board would be more than happy to speak to anybody interested about what we do, uh, what we don't do. And um, uh, yeah, we welcome your candidacy. And that is it for me. I'll turn it over to Dr. Benante. Thank you, Jen. And Good evening, everyone, and I hope everyone had a restful spring break and had some time uh, for some rest and uh, family. Um, I do have a few updates this evening. Uh, and one, I, and I think most importantly that I want to start with, is I uh, just wanted to bring to the board's attention a letter that I sent to the community this evening. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it should be in your email. It just went out a couple of hours ago. And, and over the spring recess, I probably had a little more time than I've had leading up to it, uh, just to catch up on um, some news, some things that are going on in the world and in our communities, and um, was really just increasingly concerned about the rise in anti-Asian and Pacific Islander violence that's been taking place. Uh, really, not only the incident that occurred in Georgia a, a few weeks ago, but incidents that continue to happen in communities uh, throughout our country, uh, and really underscore um, yet again, long-standing issues uh, regarding race or xenophobia uh, in our in our country, and um, I felt it was important uh, to put something out to the community just to indicate uh, that this these acts stand in, in stark opposition of our values uh, as a school community. Um, we value inclusivity and an appreciation for cultural differences in our school, and we have a lot to gain through that. And we have a lot to gain as a country through that, I, I believe, if we give ourselves the space to. Uh, and also just being encouraged that we continue to uh, promote uh, among our teaching staff, leaning into these very conversations in our classrooms in a developmentally appropriate way, uh, regardless of you know the age of our students. It's just as important in kindergarten as it is among our upperclassmen. And I, I learned a long time ago, if someone had shared with me, you know, there's really only two basic emotions uh, that we all experience. Every other one is an extension of either love or fear. And um, obviously, you can't help but to think that um, these acts uh, stem from a fear that something is somehow lost in opening ourselves or our communities to people who look different than me um, or you um, or others, instead of what's potentially gained uh, in extending an open hand to people who may seem different than us. And as a teacher, I, I struggle with it. We used to, uh, I taught fourth and fifth grades, and, and I remember the time, we don't do this so much anymore, but every, every fourth grader in the Hudson Valley would likely have a field trip uh, to the Statue of Liberty. That was a very common field trip uh, um, at the time when I taught. Um, changed a little bit after 9-11 uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, it used to be a standard part of a uh, child's elementary school experience. And we would talk about the seven points on the crown of the Statue of Liberty and what they represented. Um, and there's kind of dual symbolism there between the seven seas and continents of the world, uh, but also the seven types of liberty and freedom that citizens of our country would come to experience, uh, one of which was civil liberty. And you know, we're in a time where civil liberty is 
being discussed in many different ways, especially as it relates to race and racism. And I think, um, you know, in our schools at least, uh, these continued acts give us pause to reexamine our values and how our actions as a school community align uh, with the very best ideals uh, of our country. And more often than not, unfortunately of late, uh, many groups in our country continue to struggle to have those ideals reflected back to them in the actions that they encounter in our communities. Uh, and I hope that Haldane, uh, over time, continues to be a place uh, that stands for those ideals and, and our community members see that reflected back to them in their interactions with our school uh, and the kids see that in their interactions in our classrooms. I know we have work to do, but we're uh, committed to that. So that's a little more than I wrote in the letter, uh, but I just wanted to draw your attention to that um, and obviously um, uh, something that we're thinking a lot about right now. Uh, transitioning to just a standard update, which is COVID-related items, um, I just wanted to report that we are on track to welcome back our high school students on April 19th. Uh, we continue to work towards that. I have another meeting with the reopening task force uh, tomorrow and um, would like to thank uh, right now that, that committee for their efforts over the last uh, the, the two weeks preceding spring break and uh, again tomorrow. Uh, and in particular, I want to thank uh, Tim Walsh and Julia Sniffen, who have been very active behind the scenes in ensuring that the high school is ready um, for, students to, for all students to come back on the 19th. And we look forward to... Uh, uh, to that and that, that it's an important day for us. Uh, hopefully again, I don't want to get out too far out ahead of it, but uh, that would be the first day uh, since last March 15th that we've actually had the full uh, school community or the ability to have the full school community on campus at one time. So I, it's an important day for us and, and we're wor working very hard to make that happen uh, for our kids and for their families and for ourselves. <laughs> um, with that, I'll just pause there, see if there's any questions uh, about the school reopening. Okay. And I briefly, Jen, if I can just transition, uh, instead of doing the budget presentation first, I'd like to actually talk about the website transparency audit, because I think that's a more brief conversation, yeah. uh, if I may. So um, I don't have a slide deck for this. I did want to draw the board's attention to it. It is in the uh, file content and board docs. Um, so we last, uh, last February, around that time, we went through an audit with the comptroller's office uh, regarding school district website transparency. In the spirit of this, uh, audit was to ensure that com the community had access uh, to important information related to the school budget uh, and the school budget development process. Uh, and the, there were a few other miscellaneous items, but that was the bulk of uh, the emphasis within the, within the audit. And I'd just like to bring the board's attention to, on, on page three of the report, there's a chart, it's figure one, uh, that really summarizes in chart form what items were examined within, within the audit, and there were 10. Uh, and the chart accurately summarizes, one, did we have the information there, yes or no? And is it required <laughs> to have been on the website, yes or no? Because the audit really spanned required practices on the part of school districts, and then also just recommended best practices. They're not necessarily required by any state law, uh, but they are best practices that uh, the comptroller's office is uh, promoting. So I'm just going to go through, and uh, I've asked Ann just to come to the mic in case uh, there's anything that needs uh, further exp uh, explanation. Uh, the first being the school budget, uh, the original budget uh, that the board adopted for vote that was posted on our website. It is required for it to be posted on our website. We were, we were in a good place there. Uh, the final annual budget. Uh, the auditors determined was not posted on the website and it is required and that was one of their more major findings. I will say that this is a simple correction for us. We had it posted, we did not have it labeled as final annual budget. So, uh, we didn't have it labeled as such. So that's from a transparency perspective, the auditors determined that's not uh, the level of transparency or clarity that should, uh, that, that's required. While it's an easy fix, it's still a citation within the audit. Uh, the multi-year financial plan was probably the most, uh, the, the second 
significant finding uh, of the audit. Uh, while we are not required to develop a budget uh, or to develop a multi-year financial plan, um, and we don't, it is recommended as a best practice that we do. So Ann and I have discussed this, and that's something that we'll begin to um, uh, consider in next year's development of the budget and the district's financial plan. Um, it, it does help uh, districts do do this, and uh, we're certainly open to examining our work here through that lens, and I think it would be helpful to the board and to the community as a whole to see the longer-term implications, so beyond year one, year two, year three, of decisions that are made here uh, with the Board of Education. Uh, the budget to actual spending reports were included. Uh, they are not required. Um, uh, and then moving into some of the previous in the information away from the school budget now, just other reports that the auditors were looking for. Our external audit um, was posted. It is required. The corrective action plan was not posted. That's because we had a great external audit. There were no findings, so there was no corrective action plan to post. <clears throat> The state controller's audit, uh, which was conducted, I believe, in 2016, and if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Does that sound right? Okay. Uh, was posted. Um, that is required. Uh, the corrective action plan for that last that audit in 2016 was posted. That is required. The internal audit and corrective action plans were not posted. They're not required. We are exempt from that. So the, find, the findings were relatively, um, were important to consider, but relatively minor, I think, in, in, in terms of uh, whether or not the district is acting in a transparent manner. But we obviously look at any audit as an opportunity to uh, reflect upon our practices against not only what's required, but what, what may be best practices in the field, uh, and we're prepared to do so. So I'll pause there. Uh, that's just a, a, a brief summary. If there's any questions that Ann or I can answer. Does every school district go through this? I mean, how were we picked? <laughs> no, uh, every district does not go through it. So the, uh, we were selected at random. Um, uh, and the auditor, the controller's office will indicate that they try to uh, select a cross section of districts throughout New York State that range in size. Uh, so um, they want large districts to be a part of the audit. They want relatively small districts like ours to be a part of a part of the audit and also across different regions of the state. Um, so an explanation of how we were selected I think is included at the end somewhere, uh, but the bottom line is we get picked. I'm not sure how uh, uh, the randomizer that we're you know, picked <laughs> out of to be a part of it. So everybody's not gonna get, like to me, this is really helpful. Like that, that right. someone looked at it and said, this is what you need that will make it even more transparent. Sure. And, and I feel like we are a very transparent um, yeah. school district. So for someone to point out, oh, you missed it. And we didn't yeah. really miss it. It was there, but it, it was, was buried in a place that you had to really look for um. it. So to me, you know, this is a really good kind of audit. Yeah, I think that generally the findings in relation to what could be found or mm -hmm. not found, I For guess, sure. in relation to uh, this, uh, this scope were largely positive. Um, the, the citations, again, were quite minor when we talk about what's labeled. But the spirit of it is to obviously make sure that any community member who can easily access information about the school budget and um, and also any audits uh, that are uh, related to the school's finances. So I think we get that, we get why that's important, and we should always be checking in on that to make sure that uh, our practices are uh, aligned with best practices and also that generally that, that information is readily accessible. Um, one of the interesting flows or diagrams on here in these figures was the, the, the auditors actually went through how many, like the pathway that it takes, so how many clicks, if this is all on our website, it would take to get to certain information. And I, I think we all experience this when we visit websites sometimes. You know, if you have to click too many times, you're like, ah, I just give up. Um, and I, I think we want to keep that in mind uh, as we're uh, loading information onto our webpage. Uh, how, how much does someone have to sort through who's not necessarily may not necessarily be in the know of the district's operations and know where everything lands, uh, you know, is it relatively easy to navigate? Uh, so that's something for us to always consider as well in our website design and facilitation. Yeah, I have to admit, sometimes I go to New York State and, and pull down the Excel spreadsheet, right. just to pull down. But um, I did have a question. I, I think this was just for the prior year. 
the audit was looking at um, 1920 or 1819 or something like that? Correct. It Is was a right? one-year window. Okay. Um, yep. With the exception of the uh, previous yeah. audit, yes. comptroller yeah. audit yep. documents. Yep. So um, uh, I'm, would you go back and basically apply the best practice that you've picked up here back into the depths of our budget as far as we can go? In other words, making that transparency available as to the best that we can? Yes. Okay. Um, I think, and we made some changes last year or two years ago as well to bring budget-related documents more to organize them differently in the drives that they're yeah. contained in. Yeah. Um, they, they were a bit... Um, Everything was in there, kind of in all one spot. Yes. So we, I, uh, I know, did a year by year sort on those. Yep. Um, uh, again, we kind of come into it at different points, and we know that the summer is a good time to step back and really re-examine the entire website. That's when we normally would do that. Mm -hmm. Last summer was unique, and and we just didn't have an opportunity to uh, to go through and go through a next uh, series of revisions as we we had been doing in the previous two summers. Uh, I, I'm inclined to think that this summer will be a little bit different. We'll be yeah. able to get back to some of that yeah and i think your point is uh, just the there's the labeling yeah. character like you go back a couple of years mm -hmm. and they're slightly different in, yep. of how people put the final budget in or the yes. final administrative right yeah, and there's uh, uh, invariably multiple versions of the presentation yes before yeah so yeah great great uh, i always find the stuff i need but great thank you thank you ann We'll have more comptroller audit information to share down the road because I think we're in the middle of another audit now. So. We're constantly in the middle of another audit. We are. It does yeah. seem... Uh, and it's constantly either wrapping one up uh, or starting one. I do appreciate Margaret's question about how are we selected <laughs> for these because we yeah. always <laughs> seem to be selected like perpetual audit mode. Thank you. And um, I, I do want to thank uh, Ann and um, Megan. Am I forgetting anybody, Ann, from last year that was highly involved in this other than you and Megan? Yeah. Right. No, we appreciate it because it, it did span the beginning of the COVID pandemic and it was like, talk about less than ideal. So the auditors were great. They were they were very um, understanding of the situation that we were in. Obviously, we wanted to fulfill, um, you know, our requirements there. OK, with that, I'll transition to budget. Um, so I'm actually going to speak from the podium just so I can yeah. view the slide deck. Uh, Thank you. And a, a copy of tonight's slide deck is uh, should be loaded into board docs. It's also in the publicly accessible folder. So anybody who's watching at home that wants to go through these slides in more detail is welcome to. Um, a level, uh, just scooting around. So we've are arrived at a place that allows us, uh, we think through the budget development process, uh, to maintain our school's reputation for academic and extracurricular excellence during times of increased uncertainty. And uh, there's encouraging news that's been coming out of Albany today. Um, I won't get into too much of that, but it does seem like things are moving in a good direction for us. But as you know, in the previous month to six weeks, we really had a lot of uncertainty around the budget development process in comparison to previous years with the unclarity around how federal stimulus dollars would, uh, would make it their way to us um, and at what amount in addition to knowing that state aid, at least initially, was anticipated to remain flat, our levy remaining relatively low as compared to previous years, it was a more um, complicated budget development process. I appreciate the board's time uh, and our community members' time leading up to this because there was a lot of checking in that we, you know, I felt was important that we do uh, to put us in a good position to arrive at a recommendation for this uh, evening that uh, the community, that was palatable to the community um, and also to the board. Uh, so just with that, I'll go through a little bit of background information and then we'll get into a little more detail. Uh, this is our second full year since we drafted our strategic coherence plan. And we went into the budget development process seeking to, again, keep the main thing the main thing uh, with a focus on uh, remaining in a good position to think about our program, 
uh, how our program is designed, how our academic program is implemented, and ensuring that it, we are taking steps towards uh, bringing a level of intention into the how they essentials and how they're taught in our classroom, critical thinking, problem solving, communication skills, uh, and, 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 and the three other essentials that are not as academically uh, focused. Uh, and we feel that we've done this uh, through the budget development process. There's still uh, a healthy level of funding in curriculum development and design. There's obviously a level of support and oversight that we included two years ago uh, that will remain in this budget development process. We see that as essential from a facilitation standpoint internally. Um, and we feel in, uh, that our budget uh, does a, a good job also of maintaining certain program expectations that our community has come to uh, have, uh, specifically small class sizes that really uh, emphasize the importance of the relationships between our students, their families, and our teachers. The COVID pandemic is something that we've really had to consider going into next school year, because while our class sizes are very healthy, and you've heard me talk about before, sometimes you know there is a sweet spot, and sometimes I worry that we might be getting a little uh, too uh, biased in certain areas towards towards low class sizes, where we could you know reorganize differently and perhaps use that funding elsewhere and still have very competitive class sizes. But I think at least going into next school year, uh, there's going to continue to remain our, our keep our class sizes where they are to ensure that our students have uh, broad access to in-person instruction should they desire it, at least until if and when um, distancing guidelines change, um, which have not yet in New York. As I mentioned earlier, the low tax cap combined with uh, little additional state aid uh, gave us a sense of greater perceived stress. Our per pupil expenditures remain very low in comparison to our peer groups. And um, that's something that I think we can attribute to lower levies in years past. And as I've said, uh, right now, if we have the opportunity to levy to the limit, I believe we should. And I feel the board has supported this uh, in the previous two years uh, budget development processes. This is just an overview of those levy limits as well as the budget to budget increases. And as you can see, uh, looking into next year by the bars on the far right, uh, in comparison to the preceding four years, we are at a lower budget to budget increase and a lower uh, levy limit. And just again, a visual representation of our per pupil expenditure, Haldane in comparison to our peer group, has the lowest uh, per pupil expenditure. Um, at this point, we provide a great program uh, at a, uh, a great cost uh, to our community. As you know, when we went into budget development for this year, we did develop uh, an anticipated budget gap of $1.2 million, which in comparison to previous years was a, a significant gap. And this is mostly attributed to the uh, restraints or constraints on revenue uh, being state aid and also uh, how much we could we could levy. Uh, in some years, one of those is low in relation to the other. It's not common to have both remain relatively low, um, and, and they did or will uh, be so next year. Um, there's hope, as I said, there's encouraging news coming out of Albany that uh, there will be an adjustment to our foundation aid. That would be great for us, uh, but we're not there yet. So this is as of today, <laughs> obviously, and, and we know that some of the budget development at a state level has been slower to develop this year. Again, this is just an anticipated budget gap depicted in a different way. Our rollover budget, $26.8 million. Our estimated revenue, 25.6 for a deficit of 1.2 million. As you're aware, the administration then chose the approach to look at different uh, facets of our operation to determine if we could operate differently uh, through these areas. We looked at our administrative organization, the use of our support staff, use of related service staff, class size and structure. Uh, we also looked at any potential uh, sources of revenue, uh, notably garrisons, uh, tuition costs. And we also evaluated the use of our reserve funds to see if there was any particular strategy that we could employ through the use of reserve funds to further offset our budget deficit. 
and we arrived at these uh, reductions uh, being made or recommending that these reductions be made in preparation for next year's budget. We had the ability to create, uh, we created one separate admin position and as I spoke to you in February, we had the ability to create another. Um, we are recommending to consolidate those two positions. We had an elementary school teacher retire. We're recommending and uh, do not see a need to fill that position while still keeping our class sizes uh, uh, relatively low. We had an elementary uh, special education teacher uh, retirement and we will, or an anticipated retirement, and we will realize breakage uh, in that retirement. We do uh, see, we had a, a special education teacher um, uh, resign her position for a new position uh, elsewhere at the middle of the school year. We have not filled that position and we did not foresee a need to going into next school year. I would like to point out, we do um, anticipate additional special ed placement costs. It's reflected lower here. It's not a reduction, it's an ad. Um, uh, as well. So sometimes, depending on the needs of a student, if we had a student who was in-house uh, but now is going to an out-of-district program that had special ed staffing assigned to them, obviously that creates a, um, a void. If, um, uh, and in that case, that's, uh, these are done on a projection basis. So this is as we stand today based on some of our projections. We hired two interventionists at the beginning of the school year to assist through the teaching of remote students uh, through the pandemic. We are not going to continue with those two positions going into next school year. We had breakage on a high school guidance counselor position. Probably the most, the most significant reduction comes through a real reexamination of how we're deploying our support staff. Uh, two TAs, um, a full-time aide, and then several part-time aides, um, and feeling that we can continue to support students or provide a level of program support for students, both general ed, um, uh, around the general education environment in particular, um, while reducing staff or not filling positions that have been currently, that are currently vacant. Uh, I do want to note, because this was a point, an important point of clarification in our community forums, that um, if there's any aid support that is attached um, or for a student with an IEP or a special education program, uh, those supports continue to be provided. Um, we don't always, we, we anticipate or can in, in, uh, in, we can anticipate a certain level of support that's going to be needed based on our projection process, but the annual review process does not start, or I'm sorry, does not end until really June, and it kind of goes on uh, in a more limited fashion through the summer months. So um, this is not going to limit in any way our ability to provide such support to our special education students. We made some other program adjustments or shifted, uh, worked with our community partners to fund certain extracurricular programs through grants um, uh, and offset the cost to the district. We made a adjustment in the budget to the credits uh, that we pay uh, for teachers who take additional in-service opportunities. We saw that we were over budgeted in, in that area. And as I mentioned uh, in previous presentations through the teacher's retirement system, the final rate adjustment um, was in our favor. And through our district's uh, refinancing of some of our debt, uh, we were able to realize lower interest rates and uh, additional savings there. So with all of this, we arrived at approximately $900,000 in reductions, but we still have a remaining deficit of $292,000. And I'd just like to uh, speak to this um, in the next few slides. So as you're aware, and as I mentioned earlier, um, lawmakers did not meet the deadline for the state budget by April 1st, but it does seem uh, that's coming to a resolution now. Uh, there is a prioritization of an increase to school aid levels, which is great news for us. 
Uh, we're looking at right now a conservative estimate of 2% increase to our aid, which would yield an additional $60,000 for Haldane. May come in higher, that'd be great. We think based on what we're hearing through our respective associations, uh, we, we would yield about a 2% increase. Um, and we should learn more about this in the coming days. The also good news is both the Senate and the Assembly have rejected the local district funding adjustment, which we thought was going to be a factor uh, this year that was included in the governor's executive proposal uh, that works in our favor to an additional $100,000. Uh, so if we were to combine those two uh, funds, our deficit is reduced to $132,000. So kind of gradually working back to put ourselves in a much better position. We would then, uh, considering that deficit, applying $132,000 from the retirement contribution reserve to cover the remaining deficit. And this can be done without any additional adverse effects uh, on the forecasted retirement system rate increases. So Ann has worked through that and feels that would be, if we were to use our reserve funds, uh, that would be the most appropriate uh, use of our reserves considering the current context. And I'd like to say if um, additional aid beyond what we're projecting right now were to come in, we would just further offset this. It'd be most ideal not to have to do that, but if we had to, um, you know, we can do so and, it, and not have a dramatic impact on next year's budget. Now, I included a slide related to a contingency plan if we um, did not have additional aid from the state. I don't think we're heading in this direction, but I just did want to speak to it just in case, because you never know uh, what may transpire. The final state budget may raise the level of fund balance from the current 4% cap. You may have read about some of this in um, your NISBA updates. And again, that can really help us. So that was one uh, strategy that some lawmakers were promoting uh, in the event that aid was not going to increase because it would provide districts with the ability, again, to take to apply a particular strategy to offset um, anticipated budget deficits. So if that were to occur, we could uh, apply excess fund balance to the 21-22 budget perhaps beyond what we normally would do with the understanding that it's non-recurring revenue. And I think Ann has provided uh, an overview at our last meeting of some of the concern that comes when you're taking too much uh, fund balance and applying it in the budget. It creates a void that you then have to fill the following year. Uh, but if we were allowed to carry more than the 4% cap, it would be an opportunity to, uh, to do so without impacting uh, the district's long-term financial uh, state. And it would obviously give us time. So we typically don't uh, provide the overview of the um, three-part budget at this meeting. We usually do that at the public hearing, but I felt comfortable uh, providing you with this information. And it, was a, a, it is a template, if you will, that we work from early on in the budget development process. So I'm not going to go through these in, in great detail because they're more for your reference and for questions that you may have. You've seen these before. Uh, but I would just draw your attention to the last column, Proposed 2122, uh, which provides you with the most updated information in relation to when you would have last uh, would have last seen this in um, January or early February as to our uh, the different components of the budget and our proposed spending uh, in those areas. One thing, I, I don't want to over-scrutinize this, but I know that it's been a, uh, um, it got a little bit of uh, attention as we were talking about administration. I would just draw your, your attention to the uh, percentages as a component of our budget um, for each segment. So admin, capital and and um, uh, program sorry um, you know our our spending and administration has has remained relatively stable so I, I I just don't want it to be lost that um, I think the the strategy or what I may have um, not communicated clearly enough was that how we're trying to organize our administration is largely looking at monies that are already included uh, in the budget just reorganizing how those monies how, how those monies are organized how those positions are organized uh, to better meet the needs of the district um, uh, so our spending and admin has remained relatively stable 
uh, stable over the last uh, few years. Uh, similarly, in, in, in capital, um, you know, if, if we're looking at what's really driving our costs, and it shouldn't really be a surprise, the majority of our staffing is, uh, is incorporated into the program, as it should be. Um, and that's where, you know, we're going to see uh, the most significant um, increase in costs um, for the time being. Uh, is going to come out of that program component of the budget. Again, it's not a bad thing, uh, but in terms of where costs are being driven or what's driving the uh, increased costs in the budget, it's, it's really program that's doing that. Um, okay, so the component summary is, oh, sorry, is here for your review as well. And as we can't forget, we're also going to have a second proposition that would be included in the budget uh, for a vehicle proposition. Um, this is part of the regular cycle uh, that we are on. I'll have more to share about this, obviously, when we're speaking to the community, understands the dynamics of this. These are often uh, budget-neutral propositions. It helps us maintain our existing fleet of buses. Um, after a period of time, we have to take certain vehicles off the road by state law. Um, and this, uh, our proposal this year, we anticipate uh, one bus replacement um, and two minivans uh, that will finance over a five-year period. So with that, uh, Ann and I will pause for questions. I, I'm sorry, I forgot one last thing uh, the board's familiar with is just the, the anticipated tax cap, impact. Uh, so at a tax levy increase of 1.88%, depending on the market value of your home, these are the anticipated tax increases uh, that one would see to their tax bill. Um, again, the increase from the amount that's currently being paid, so not the overall taxes. Um, but if you have an assessed home, uh, or home market value, excuse me, of $500,000, uh, this proposed budget uh, would uh, approximately cause an increase of $160 to the school tax bill um, that that homeowner would be paying. Okay. So all things considered, we feel we've developed a, a budget that uh, maintains uh, our core values as a school district, um, things that make us unique as a school community uh, going into next school year through a, a time that was quite uh, difficult to, uh, as you know, to develop a, a budget for the upcoming school year. Um, I do think, again, in the next few days, we'll have a little bit more information about anticipated state aid, so we'll be able to provide the board with an update on how that will influence budget development process. But as it comes to the levy, uh, the amount the, the board can levy uh, from the community or put before the community to levy, we're recommending, obviously, levying up to that limit, and we still feel within that is a very competitive uh, balance between academics, athletics, and the arts for our students for next school year. So I'm going to come back to the seat, and I'll come up to the microphone, and we can answer questions that the board may have. Questions for Ann or Dr. Benante? I just want, I, I always get confused, um, and that's because I get confused. R remind me, okay, breakage means a teacher retires and invariably we have long tenured who have gone through steps and are well paid, compensated for their time and their experience, and we end up hiring a teacher who is less tenured, in fact, maybe not tenured at all, and the breakage is the delta between those two. So it is not somebody going away and not filling the position. That's right? correct. Is that right? Okay. So of those two, there are two, I, the term is always a little bit wonky for me. So it's basically we're getting a cheaper person, at the yeah. net, 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 and we're realizing that savings. That's right? correct. Okay. So, and then there are a couple on here, the teacher retirement and the two interventionists and the high school special education are actual, I'm not getting into the TAs, or the, uh, but those are positions that are going away. Correct. Okay, great, good, thank you, that, that's useful. Um, uh, and I think you made this comment, but I'd, I'd reinforce and just remind myself that as the special education process plays out through the rest of the spring and into the summer, if, 
and when probably any um, child goes through the process and the program to address those, that child's needs requires the hiring of a teacher that regardless of whatever we pass in the budget, that will happen. Okay, all right. Yeah, and depending on what those needs are, it's unique to go through a process where a child would require their own teacher. Right. Um, and, and that's something that we take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Each of our special educators carries a certain case load. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, more often than not, they're teaching multiple students. Right. And we, what we want to be wary of is what that number is. Right. Um, and then how that impacts their assignment. Does that spread them apart across too many uh, classrooms potentially? And that's something that we always have an eye on. Okay. Uh, but generally, um, but yes, to, to, to answer your question yeah, and reiterate. At yeah. its most fundamental level, if there's an investment required to meet the needs of a special education student that is uncovered after the budget is set, yeah. okay. we always provide yeah. it. I think it's important to remember that a budget is just you know, a projection, yeah. right? It's, it's not uh, set in stone. Right. And just like this year, perfect example, we didn't budget in two interventionists. Right. It's just right. ended up that we needed them. And so we figured it out. Um, and made some adjustments, right? Yeah. So the same thing would happen in a special education case. Um, adjustments would be made as necessary. Yeah. And the process for those adjustments is actually really quite transparent, right? <laughs> because they come through in our financial reports as yeah. budget transfer documents, yes, right? So right. it's not, this isn't something that's mysteriously happening behind the scenes. It yeah. happens very transparently. Yes. I'm just looking to you to make sure I'm not misstating anything. <laughs> I think I'm right, but I'm never sure. <laughs> I'm not always sure. And so my, my last question would be uh, um, option C. So option A is the state comes through with funding. We have $102,000, $32,000 gap. We fill that with basically savings that have been allocated for retirement. We say some of those savings that have been allocated for retirement, we use them to the, because we, every year we have retirement costs, we use some of those savings to fulfill those retirement costs, fine. Um, option B, the state doesn't come through with anything. We think there may be an opportunity to carry over more, more than 4%, we fill. Option C, the state doesn't come through and they don't increase the 4%. It seems less likely okay. now than it right. did a month ago. Okay. okay. Uh, and I think that's good news good. Um, that, that we're going to get Something. Something's in okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm sure Anne has thought about option C more than I have okay. right. right now. But um, as we started to see indications that we were moving away from that scenario, okay. uh, and each passing week has only in indicated th that that's less likely. Okay. Um, we've spent less time on it. Okay. All right. Fair. I, I think in part of that, John, as you uh, and as the board knows, we, we had other reductions or potential area for reductions that were included in my initial budget sure. yeah. uh, presentation. And um, uh, as we've been able to and had a greater sense of confidence, we've taken those out. Mm -hmm. Because the option uh, C was, would be go to further into right. making reductions. But um, we don't want to, there's a, it's a difficult balance to maintain of, of making a community aware of what may be coming, but not causing any unnecessary alarm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd say if we had one more week, we wouldn't have had to provoke any unnecessary alarm. But, but we, we did think a month ago that, may, that option C, if you will, very well may have played out. So we did have other potential areas for reduction that we'll have to, that we would consider okay. um, that we'd bring back in and, as part of our recommendation. But I don't think we have, we're gonna be in that position. Sure. Do we have any projection of when we'll be really sure option C isn't going to be a problem? It's, it sounds like within a week. Within um, a week? Yeah, it very well could be by the time this meeting's over and we look at our email again. Okay. Because every hour we're, we're getting, today we were getting more clarity on what very well may uh, be the resolution at a state level to the budget. And all signs are encouraging. We just don't know. It's similar to the federal stimulus money in that we don't know. Uh, based on what we're hearing today, what the actual dollar impact will be for Haldane. 
Um, and that's going to take a couple days. So uh, we, it ultimately culminates in an updated chart that we get sent to us with our updated school aid runs. And those are usually released. Uh, well, uh, last year, uh, uh, I found one on Twitter. Um, you know, so <laughs> depending on what media source you're, uh, you're observing, you know, it you, you could be a day uh, between when you're actually getting it. And, um, so I think in the next few days, we'll see it. We're soon. Okay. okay. I have one final very technical question. Is there a list? It, do we know all the properties that are assessed that pay property tax? I believe we do. Yes. And, and okay. Is that, a, is that public information? Yes, it okay. is. I'd be, I'm interested in that. Um, there's not a lot of building going on, but like the total value of the community went up Last year, this year, yeah, I think with Butterfield primarily, but um, I'm interested in how that plays out. Uh, it, and uh, when uh, I'm sure you know this, um, and I'm sorry for putting you on the spot <laughs> if you don't, but uh, I feel like I've lived through this once or twice before. When the assess when the assessor, the market value, is increasing in a community, um, and I think Cold Spring and Phillips Town in general. Uh, we've seen that, and I think through the coherence planning process, we actually looked at that. It doesn't necessarily equate, though, to increase revenue for the school. Correct? Uh, I'm, Correct. I was, sorry, I was talking about something different. When a significant portion of new taxable oh, yeah. quantity comes, that could have the impact of decreasing the tax or lowering the impact for everybody who else who was already there because Correct. you're having new parcels that are now being taxed. Okay. That happened last year, which is why our tax rate increase wasn't as large, because a lot of the Butterfield um, condominiums came onto the tax roll. Got it. And so our increase was even lower last summer, yep. when yep. even though the board put $50,000 of excess fund balance towards the tax levy, um, it already had come in under the estimate because of that. They anticipate a little bit more. There's not a whole lot of new building going yeah, on yeah. Um, as far as brick and mortar goes. Right. Um, so we look forward to that because we do have conversations with the assessor's office. But each year, um, the new assessments, some, you know, it does go up because as when properties change hand, then the property is reassessed. Um, but as the market, the market doesn't really affect it because the equalization rate right, right, right. changes right. and that keeps things steady. Um, Fishgill is a very small piece of our uh, tax levy and so is Putt Valley. So 96% is Phillips Town and Cold Spring and they're only at 0.46 for an equalization rate. So that equalization rate is gonna change but that distribution um, is, you know, we're, we're good with with our projections, except for new. And yeah, I've, that. you know, I've never seen it go down, even if it goes up a little, mm -hmm. which is why our estimate, I'm pretty confident. I don't like to put numbers out there um, that someone could come back and say, you said, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> so I'm confident that what we present, um, it's going to come in under. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions about the budget? I know we've been living with this for a while. <laughs> um, feels like we've gotten to a really good, clear place with it. Thank you to Anne and Dr. Benante for their work. Um, and as a reminder to us, the board um, will be asked to adopt this budget proposal at our next meeting on April 20th. So if there are further questions or concerns between now and then, um, you should bring them up. Um, and we might have some more information as well um, throughout the week um, to solidify right. the proposal as well. Are there any more community touch points or fora or something? I think after we do the adoption, 
Dr. Benante will get the show That's on the road. That's when we do the more the road show, get out the vote yeah. uh, piece. But we front loaded the community check ins yes. prior to break, just given the unique circumstances. And um, there aren't any currently scheduled between now and the 20th. Um, however, if there was a desire to do so, just as if that would be helpful to the board, we're, you know, I certainly can put one together. No, I think it makes sense to wait till the piece is, is complete and then we'll have about a month to get the word out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You. Is there any communication from the public at this time? Oh, good. Oh, Maggie, I'm going to read the, the, the rules then. <laughs> the Haldane Board of Education desires and values input from the entire school community. For those who wish to address the board, please sign in and state your name for the record. The sign-in sheet is with Ms. Platt. Please keep your remarks to three minutes or less. Disparaging remarks and discussion of district personnel are prohibited. Although we do not engage in dialogue, we are listening. Please leave your contact information with our district clerk, and a prompt response will follow from either myself or Dr. Benante. Okay, now you can come to the point. So, I am Maggie Valentine. I'm a parent of a fourth grader and a first grader. Um, I am also a softball coach for Phillipstown Little League, uh, mm -hmm. kindergarten and first grade, which I got my voice back a little bit. Today was our first practice and it was insane, but on behalf of Little League, I just wanted to thank Dr. Benante and the school for allowing us, like you do every year, to um, share the field, share the Haldane Softball Diamond um, and Lower Perkins. Um, it is especially significant this year because we have over 70 girls, children, signed up for softball, which in terms of participation number is our biggest year in at least a decade, so it's exciting. and. Um, it's aspirational for many of the girls, many of the children, I should say, um, to play on that field. So I just wanted to thank you for that. It's exciting. Um, I also wanted to thank the board members for all the questions that you ask all year long, especially now during the budget process. Um, I know a lot of parents who, for whatever reason, don't ask a lot of questions. They appreciate it. They're listening. They want more questions. Um, it gives them a level, obviously, a level of clarity. Um, and I also wanted to announce my intention to run for the school board. Um, yeah, and I look forward to potentially working with some of you. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, any other communication with the public? Okay, going into our information reports, they are here for anyone's uh, viewing pleasure. Consent agenda minutes, may I have a motion please? So moved. Second. These are our minutes from the March 16th and the March 23rd meetings. Are there any questions, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 The committee minutes are here for um, our review, Buildings and Grounds Committee and the Technology Committee. Consent Agenda Financial. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Consent Agenda Personnel. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh. Please. That. I'm sorry, Jen. Um, just on the approval of two full-time bus drivers oh, yeah, that sure. we've, just wanted to mention to the board, uh, we've had a hard time filling the part-time bus driver positions. Uh, when that occurs, we have to pull our um, shared maintenance transportation workers out of their maintenance role to ride the bus, which creates a stress, obviously, in, in keeping up with certain maintenance responsibilities, which are really important, obviously, right now, um, especially as it relates to cleaning. Uh, so we feel that by consolidating the part-time positions into two full-time positions, we'll get a better, can better candidates who are more inclined to, to take the position and alleviate some of the stress that uh, we're seeing right now on our, on our shared position. So uh, this is ultimately budget neutral uh, because we're going to eliminate the, the part-time driver positions um, once these are filled. Thank you. Um, all, all those in favor? Aye. 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 We're going into new business. There's only one item listed, but there's actually three. And I apologize, they're kind of last minute things that happened over spring break. So don't get too excited. There are a couple more things after one. So uh, CSE, CPSE recommendations, Ms. Platt. 
Be it resolved that, upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the recommendations of the Committees on Special Education and Preschool Special Education as presented. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, so just two other things. The first thing is that um, the Garrison School Board had to talk to us about potentially doing a, an equity, adversity, and inclusion training with them. Um, and they are moving forward with that and trying to nail down some dates for um, some summer, a summer retreat. And Margaret, I don't have to look at you for this because you're not, <laughs> you won't be there. Um, so I'm just going to share the two dates with you that they're trying to consolidate their nine person board plus superintendent oh around. Really? So it's like, or seven person board, oh, okay. seven person board and the superintendent. So they've started this early. Typically we wait till like the new board members are all elected to talk about summer, but I'm just going to, the process is starting. So they've thrown out two dates, July 17th or August 28th, both are Saturdays. Um, and both Dr. Benante and I would prefer the August 28th date. So um, I'm throwing that out to you guys. You don't need to say anything about it right this second, but if you could maybe get back to me sometime this week, that would be great um, if August 28th would work for you. Yeah? Um, so. We'll see. The um, other thing I wanted to mention was, um, I wanted to turn over to Peggy for just a second. We've been talking about the superintendent evaluation schedule. Um, so I don't know if you have it in front of you, but if you just want to make mention of where we're at with that. Yeah, I, I, I don't, for one reason, because I didn't have a chance to, <laughs> to update it. in front it. of me. Oh, Actually. well, it's got to be updated. But so. it has to be updated. So. It has to be updated. So I've been in communication with Dr. Benante in the past. Uh, our goal always is to have this signed in in place by June 1st, which is a contractual mandate uh, or requirement, um, and uh, which often means we get Dr. Benante's material sometime in April, and then it's, it's a kind of leisurely process where we have executive board meetings and then we meet with him for some very good reasons. I think we want to push that the date when we get the, the materials back from Dr. Benante just because so many things are going on until early, until early May. Um, and then what I just need to do is just sit down with a calendar. We'll probably still, I'm actually thinking maybe we would do our exec session, just the board, the night of the annual meeting. And then we'd, we could definitely get Dr. Benante something to sign by June 1st, but I think even if we needed to squeeze in another meeting before then, do the meeting on the first, we'll be fine. So I'm um, just mm -hmm. a heads up, that's so in the process, I mean, and I'll, I'll, I'll get you that timeline soon. Right, oh, that's perfect. I think that's really, that's, 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 it. A, that's a short version. It's just a little <laughs> foreshadowing to expect an ev superintendent evaluation timeline really in your inbox, in and we might be doing some executive sessions in May um, yeah. surrounding that. Yeah. There's, I think there's a slight chance that we might have an extra meeting, but we'll, 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 we'll we see could, what we can, we can figure that out. Okay. I think we could also just sign it and then have the meeting after it's signed, because I don't, okay. that's my other thought about that. Okay, okay. So that's coming. Um, and that's it. Is there any communication from the public? No. Are there any board reflections to share? Dr. Benante, do you have anything you would like to share? Nothing further, Jen, thank you. Okay, then I would like to make a motion to adjourn. May I have a second, please? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good, thank you very much. Aye.